The bikers loaded the boat with weapons, knives, and guns. Tonight, the rock star who sold them out was going to die. The bikers threw everything they had into that boat, and the rock star, he slept soundly, unaware of the hell that was coming for him. Hold on, because this story gets wild. Because rock stars, real rock stars, they do insane things and they have insane things happen to them. These are the stories I tell. Stories of music history, mystery, and misadventure with a heavy side of true crime. Music storytelling. If you're into that sort of thing, then bang on that subscribe button like Charlie Watts and turn on all notifications so you never miss any of our weekly uploads or our daily shorts. All right, I'm Jake Brennan. This is Disgraceland in three, two, rock a roll. At the end of the 1960s, Mick Jagger was fronting the biggest rock band in the world. The Rolling Stones were at their creative peak, in the middle of one of the greatest four album streaks in music history. But the British government was coming after Mick for tax money that he didn't have. And there was an open contract on his life. The Rolling Stones were recovering from the death of founding member Brian Jones in July 1969. And after missing out on playing Woodstock, the Stones decided to organize a West Coast Woodstock in San Francisco. From San Francisco, famous for food, comes the Rolling Stones. The idea was that the free show was supposed to be a gift to Stones fans in the United States. The band hadn't toured America since 1966, mostly due to drug charges that made it hard for the band to travel. The plan was for the free concert to include sets by the Grateful Dead, Crosby, Stills and Nash and & Young, and the Jefferson Airplane. But the show was cursed from the jump. The concert was originally scheduled in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, but San Francisco cops were tired of dealing with hippies and they blocked the permits. So two days before the concert, the venue was changed to the raceway at Altamont, located an hour out from San Francisco and Northern California. Thousands of Rolling Stones fans were expected. So security was obviously needed. So the Rolling Stones then made one of the worst decisions in music history. No! They hired the Hells Angels to run security. And the Stones knew the British version of the Hells Angels and who they were a bit softer around the edges than their US counterparts. And the British Hells Angels provided security at the Stones free show at Hyde Park back in July, a couple months prior. And at the memorial for Rolling Stone, Brian Jones, who drowned dead by misadventure at only 27 years old. And the Grateful Dead, these guys vouched for the San Francisco branch of the Hells Angels. In the 60s, hippies and bikers ran in the same crowd. The hippie movement saw the angels as kindred spirits living off of the edges of society. They overlooked the fact that, unlike most rock and roll bands, the Hells Angels were also a violent gang of outlaws. The Altamont concert went about as badly as it could. The Hells Angels were paid $500 and a bunch of beer to sit on the edge of the stage and make sure the crowd didn't mess with the bands. And by the middle of the day, the Hells Angels patrolled the audience with sawed-off pool cues and motorcycle chains. They knocked out the lead singer, the Jefferson Airplane. Hey man, I'd like to imagine that the Hells Angels just uh, smashed Marty Ballin in the face and knocked him out for a bit. I'd like to thank you for that. And stabbed Stephen Stills in the leg with a wheel spoke. It was such a mess that when the Grateful Dead, who recommended the Angels to begin with, got there, they heard about the state of things, they turned right around and they got the hell out. And that's them leaving on a helicopter. And by the time the Rolling Stones took the stage after sundown, their concert at Altamont was balanced on a knife's edge, figuratively. However, it was a literal knife that would end up in the back of a 17-year-old fan stabbed and kicked to death by the Hells Angels. His name was Meredith Hunter, and he died while the Rolling Stones played on, unaware of the fatality in the crowd. But the murder was caught on film. The Stones weren't making money off of tickets, but they were making money off of the film rights to the concert, which they sold. A documentary film crew shot the whole day. 
and got footage of Meredith Hunter jumping into the air with a gun in his hands and immediately being dragged down by the Hells Angels. That footage would eventually be seen in the great documentary, Gimme Shelter. What happened here anyway? He pulled out a gun. He did? Yes, the Hells Angels took the gun away from him. One of them has it now, he showed it to me. By the time the Stones got off the stage and crammed into their helicopters, Altamont had devolved into chaos. In the end, there were four dead. And the finger pointing began immediately. The California bands on the scene were quick to absolve the Hells Angels of any wrongdoing. The way they saw it, the Angels had a strict code that they lived by. And when you brought them into a situation like this, you got what you ordered. But they also fired the Angels from security at any of their future gigs. Bands like the Jefferson Airplane and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, they blamed the Stones for poor planning. The Rolling Stones guitarist Keith Richards said that, except for a couple people, the concert had been pretty good. From where Keith stood, the Stones killed it on stage. And Mick Jagger was messed up over the whole thing. He didn't step up to take the blame, and nor did he argue that the Hells Angels hadn't done anything wrong either. And for the Hells Angels, Mick's failure to clear them of blame was a betrayal. And pretty soon, news got around that the Stones had footage of the murder. Footage they'd already shared with the cops and were planning to put on the big screen in their concert film in a couple of months. All of the Hells Angels' anger over the blame placed upon them over the death of Meredith Hunter at Altamont, that anger, the Hells Angels focused it and their wrath on Mick Jagger. And the word went out. There was an open contract on the lead singer of the Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger was marked for death. Before we get into the rest of this insane story, go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you have not already. You're here. I'm here. You like crazy stories of music history, mystery, and misadventure with a heavy side of true crime. And those are the stories that I tell here in Disgraceland. So, like I said, bang on that subscribe button like Graham Parsons banged out his welcome at Nelcott. Turn on all notifications so you never miss any of our weekly uploads or our daily shorts. And now, get off of my cloud and back into the story. In a New York City biker bar, a pack of Hells Angels threw back beers and talked about how Mick Jagger had betrayed the motorcycle club. Never mind that these particular angels weren't even remotely involved in what went down at Altamont. The Hells Angels were one big, violent, dysfunctional family. If you stabbed one of them in the back, you stabbed them all in the back, or so went the thinking. And the bikers wanted revenge, but they figured Mick Jagger was safe at home in London or wherever. One of the angels set the others straight. Mick Jagger was closer to them than they thought. Mick Jagger was on Long Island. Talk amongst yourselves. The Rolling Stones, along with most other British rock bands, had a complicated relationship with the country of their birth. Britain was changing the way it taxed the very rich, and musicians like the Beatles, the Stones, and David Bowie owed up to 90% of their earnings. Be thankful I don't take it all. But in the early days of rock and roll, Artists were screwed out of money by anyone who had their fingers in the proverbial pie. Even the biggest acts were recovering from bad deals that they made in the days when success seemed like a moonshot. The British government effectively was asking for money that the Rolling Stones or other English bands did not have. And for a lot of musicians, this meant relocating outside of the UK. John Lennon ended up in New York, David Bowie split his time between Berlin and Switzerland to avoid paying his tax bills, and the Stones famously wound up in exile, first in the south of France where they rented a mansion and built a makeshift recording studio in the basement, and eventually back to the United States. Mick Jagger went into seclusion in the Hamptons out on Long Island in New York, a continent away from the bloodshed at Altamont on America's west coast and safe from the tax man in London and well out of the reach of the California branch of the Hells Angels. But the Angels weren't a regional concern. They were a national organization. And the word of an open contract on Mick Jagger's life had gone coast to coast. The news had already reported that Mick was staying in the Hamptons at Andy Warhol's place. From there, it was easy enough for the New York Angels to get an address. They scouted Warhol's place, where Mick was staying in the Hamptons. And they saw the one thing that the Altamont concert lacked. 
proper security. Guards with rifles patrolled outside of the house, and maybe they were hired in response to recent events, and maybe they were hired out of just proper precaution, but who knows? What we do know is that Mick Jagger didn't know that the Hells Angels had a hit out on him. The Angels weren't looking for a gunfight. A frontal assault was not gonna work, so they turned around and hit the nearest friendly bar to regroup and reconsider their plan. They came up with a different idea. Jagger was staying in a house on the shore. Along the southern edge, there was a garden with no security. If the Angels couldn't get to Mick by land, they'd get to him by sea. If this seems like a plan that a bunch of stoned bikers cooked up after a few rounds of beer, you're not wrong. The next step for the Hells Angels was to get weapons, guns, and knives They were easy to come by at a bar full of Hells Angels, and the bikers left with all the weapons they needed to kill a rolling stone. Now they needed a boat. A slow bike ride along the south shore scored them a dinghy. Quit playing with your dinghy. Barely big enough for the bikers and their weapons. Ready for battle, the Hells Angels shoved the boat into the water and climbed aboard. The little dinghy loaded up with bulky biker dudes puttered off of the south shore and into the Atlantic. It was December, it was freezing. Just weeks ago, there was an outdoor music festival in California, and now here these guys were, trying to keep out of the winter wind with their leather jackets. The wind picked up, and the bikers were having trouble keeping control of the boat. And when they looked to the shore, they couldn't really be sure which house Mick Jagger was staying at. All the fancy beach houses looked the same in the dark from the water. And the bikers may have been hellions on the road, but they were not lords of the sea. They didn't notice the storm. So with no boating experience and no navigational skills, they were making terrible time in the dark. And the storm overtook them. It came up from the east and caught them unprepared. And they hardly got their bearings before another wave hit, and it capsized the boat, dumped the bikers and their weapons into the ocean. The Hells Angels swam to shore. The cold dip sobered them up enough to convince them that a second attempt at killing Mick Jagger wasn't worth it. It wasn't until 15 years later that the Hells Angels contract on Mick Jagger became public knowledge, when an informant from the biker gang gave an anonymous testimony in front of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. The planned attack by sea, it wouldn't come out until 2008 when an FBI agent told the whole story. Mick Jagger never knew he was targeted or that he came one winter storm away from death, spared by a little bit of sympathy for the devil. And after that, the Stones went on to launch their own record label and their stable of artists included reggae legend Peter Tosh, who wouldn't be so lucky when it came to avoiding murderous home intruders. But that's another story. If you like this video, let me know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe and turn on all notifications so you never miss an upload. If you want more of this type of music and true crime storytelling, then check out the Disgraceland podcast. Jerry Lee Lewis allegedly murdering his wife Keith Richards trafficking heroin, Nipsey Hussle's murder, Taylor Swift's stalkers, The Grateful Dead, Cardi B, The Beatles, Marvin Gaye, The Rolling Stones, and more. Disgraceland is available for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are available. And I'm available on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook at Disgraceland Pod. Or you can call me and leave me a voicemail or text at 617-906-6638. See you next week right here on Disgraceland, right in this channel. Rock a roller.